We're so glad you joined us today for this very special Thanksgiving Sabbath program. Join with your family or whoever is with you there in your place, and I hope you have had a very rich Thanksgiving experience this week. We want to talk to you as we get started today just about one of the pieces of Thanksgiving, and that's the giving. And it is out of the giving that we find joy, and it is a way of expressing our thanks. And I know the Lord has blessed us in this most unusual of years. He's certainly blessed this church, and the congregation has been incredibly, incredibly generous this year. We have the opportunity to end this year in a very strong financial position, but we've got to be strong in these last two months. So as you know, we've set a $500,000 church budget goal for the last two months. 350000 of that was already in our budget. The rest of it has to do with some maintenance and some upkeep that we need to do on the facility. And if we can hit this number at the end of this year, we will be in an amazing position financially for the next year, which is quite remarkable considering all that we've been through in this year. So, so this is our chance to finish strong uh, with our finances in the church for this year. But that's not the only thing going on right now. We also have some opportunities. So Pastor Mark, tell us about those. Yeah, we have an opportunity that we've called the Warehouse Project, and it is a project. Um, it's an empty shell. We're standing in it right now. It's an amazing opportunity. Some of you may have heard of the Warehouse Project. If you haven't heard of the Warehouse Project, there's a lot of information on our website that you can go to. But we do, as Jeff says, we do have an incredible, sacrificially generous church, and it blows me away every single time. I had somebody come up to me and said, I, I want to know our family is exploring a way to be a part of this warehouse project. And so they have come up very sacrificially generous, and they have come up with $100,000 to not just give to us, but as a matching donation. So we want to raise $100,000, and for every dollar that we raise, it will be matched up to $100,000, and that's an incredible opportunity that just came in the last couple weeks. So we're excited about that, and that's just one more thing that we want to tell you guys about. And if you're a young adult, I'm speaking to you right now. We at this church have had the opportunity to experience amazing worship, community, and youth. Maybe you've grown up in this church, or maybe you're new to the church. If you're 18 and over and whatever you consider a young adult, I believe now it's 40, is what many consider a young adult. But if you are, the challenge here is to not only get involved, and, and we've been challenging you if you've been part of Upper Room and have been coming to that, the challenge has been to be part of this community in more ways than one. And part of that is in your giving and in your generosity. And maybe you're a college student, maybe $5 is all you can give, but know that during this time, that can be doubled. And so we want you to be part of this journey in your serving, in your leadership, in your involvement, and in your giving. So whether it's $5, $50, $500, whatever the case may be, as a young adult, the challenge to you is to take part in this project and to make it your own as well as it is ours. So you remember for our online services, we have five ways to give. We have the online ways. There's uh, uh, the Tithely app and the Adventist Giving app. Go ahead and get on those things right now and uh, make your donations. As well as that, you can set up payments uh, through your bank, which is the model that I use, and that will automatically be taken care of. Uh, you can also come by the church at any point and leave uh, your offering in the, in the drop box outside. You'll see that outside. And if it's during office hours, you'll probably find someone in the office. In addition to that, you can put it in the mail, uh, just standard mail. So we thank you for your generosity and uh, are glad to be experiencing this season of Thanksgiving with you. So what were you expecting 2020 to be like? I'll bet one thing you didn't expect was that you would become accustomed to having meetings like this, sitting in your office, staring at a little camera on your computer screen, talking to everybody else in the various places that they are. Anybody that's been spent any time with me this year has gotten used to this background, because this is where I am every time we meet. 
I even have a nice little air filter in here now. It's kind of a crazy new normal that we're living in these days. Sometimes we set out on a voyage with an expectation of how the trip's going to go, and it doesn't quite go the way we expected. I would say 2020 has been that kind of a trip. The, the pilgrims got on a boat a long time ago in the year 1620. They got on the Mayflower to sail across to a new world, to start a new life, to start a new reality. They believed God was leading them. They got on with certain expectations, but one of them wasn't that that trip was going to take 10 weeks, and they were going to be in the middle of a lot of really rough weather, and that that first year there was going to be really hard. But we don't always know what's ahead, do we? In fact, Scripture very clearly says, Proverbs 16, verse 9, The mind of a person plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. We've been directed this year in some ways we probably didn't plan to go. We've had experiences this year we didn't plan to have. Many people in our church were scrambling as they are in the medical community and were trying to deal with the potential problems of this crisis. Thankfully, some of the worst scenarios didn't happen. But who'd have thought we would go so many months without our worship service? And so here we are, the time of year when we normally have a big festival Sabbath. We gather together and we rejoice and worship the Lord, and it, it thrills our hearts. But that's not an option this year. But this is what we're doing, what we're trying to do here, trying to find hope, trying to be thankful in this day. That hope's got to center in Jesus. Can we put our faith in him? Can we trust him to lead us to the path? I'm glad you're with us for this journey, for this voyage today. And I pray that by the end of this time we spend together, you'll be standing on the solid rock that is our Lord. Thanks for joining us.
began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very Hector Alvarez and I'm a middle school math teacher. My name is Dan Burrington. I'm a registered nurse. I spent the last seven years working at the Orange County Jail as the Horizon Clinic nurse responsible for two of the buildings and on weekends I work in the main clinic. Well my name is Danielle MD and I have been living here in Florida for about 27 years and I'm a nurse at Advent Health Altamont and I have been there for about 25 years. I'm Chris Lane and I'm a nurse at Winnie Palmer. What's the question? Jackson. Kindergarten. Well, I teach. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at Advent Health University and so I teach classes there throughout the week. My name is Joshua Chobatar and I am in eighth grade. My name is Clifton Scott. Professionally, I work as Senior Director of Operations at Advent Health Celebration. Well, my name is Sean Robinson. I'm Michelle. And um, we're married. <laughs> and this is Theodore. This is our baby. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Michael Fisher. Um, and this is Matthew. He's a little guy, or yeah. two years old. Just turned two yesterday. Yeah. yeah and I'm Shirlene Fisher, so proud mom of our little guy and a proud wife of my dear husband. With COVID around, you have all these questions because tomorrow is unsure. You don't know what's, what's really happening. Um, financially, it can be a little scary. So our little guy here, Matthew, that we were talking about, he is our only son, our only child, but um, he is not our first pregnancy. So it's been a journey and uh, his, uh, you know, building a family has been a journey. I really like the inmates. Most of them are they're like you and me. And part of it was the fact is they know I didn't have to be nice to them. So when I was, it meant something to them. When COVID came along, I saw that my exposure was going to be very much uh, putting me in danger. At my age, 67 years old, I'm, I'm at risk. My wife has severe asthma in the wintertime and I felt like I couldn't continue it. So, you know, one point back in March, I decided to resign my position. So March 23rd was, it actually starts a little before that, in the month of March of 2020, we all started hearing about this virus, COVID-19. And it was kind of far away. It was in Washington State and in New York. And, um, you know, it had already affected our community a little bit. Just my kids were home from school. Our spring break was canceled, um, our trip we had planned. And I um, 
March 24, we were watching TV and I coughed. A couple days later, I did come home and I had a fever. I had chills and I, my skin hurt. I didn't feel terrible, but um, we decided to get me tested for COVID-19. That was on a Wednesday. And um, Sunday, my results came back and they were positive. That week, it was definitely a spiraling down in my, in my COVID story. For me, it's been a little bit of an up and down. Um, in the beginning of the year, um, I really wanted to transfer out of my unit and because I thought it was my time, I thought it was God's time for me to go. Um, and I got a call from HR right before the pandemic hit. And then um, due to COVID, they put a hold on everything. So I was unable to get into the position that I wanted to. Working in healthcare has resulted in me not being able to work at home. Um, so I've, I've had to essentially go to work during this um, entire pandemic, um, which has resulted also in me being the primary uh, grocery shopper and um, I guess person who goes out and makes all the runs to buy whatever is needed for the house. So that's been interesting. Having to stay six feet away from everyone, that's boring. Just boring, 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 so bad because I do not like six feet away. It's just sad that I can't hug. It kind of makes me cry in my own mind. And I don't like saying six feet away from my Gigi. She's just funny because, she's funny like this because she spoils me, but she wants to ask my mom for everything. So she's kind of funny. Well, last year I went to um, Fleece and I was in seventh grade. Um, this year, because of COVID, I'm doing Florida Virtual and I'm staying home because of that, so. I, I have a few friends at Fleece and they are, I mean, I don't really, I only really know them at Fleece and I like to hang out with them, but this year I can't and I'm not sure about next year because I don't know where they're gonna go. I had to be at home and teach from my bedroom because that was the only quiet place in the house and the students would be in their home. I just, I like teaching health um, and just my students, you know, um, learning and also I learn from them too and just see the changes that they have in their life. I guess when I read their papers and just how they've applied the health principles and how they've benefited from that, um, that's things that don't come in the paycheck, you know, those are just awesome things to hear and read um, and then sometimes I see them later on and, and they share with me. Um, so that's probably just the interaction I'd say with my students and, they, and I'm able to pray with them too. A lot of them are going through some things and I think with COVID that just exponentially makes it more difficult because um, we go through things anyway but then you add COVID on the mix and um, so just being able to pray for them and um, you know they share their prayer requests and then they'll share you know when they've been answered requests too or they share praises and I like that too just the connection with them that's probably my favorite part. I am a very type A person like I have a huge calendar I have appointments every day I have things that I need to do like I'm always go, 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 go all the time. So for me to just like stop, it was unnatural. I will use that word. Um, so I had to adjust, like really adjust and just focus on me really. And what I would like to see in like my personal life, my, my spiritual life. Like I had the time to sit down and think about all those things, like where I would like to see myself. Um, because during those quiet moments and those still moments, it's a lot of reflection time. It's a lot of like, wow, like am I still in the same spot that I am last year or have I grown? Like even if it's just a little bit. Um, and I was like, I didn't see the progress that I wanted to see. Um, I was actually looking back at my journals from last year because I write journal every time it's my birthday. And I was like, this is where I wanted to be in my relationship with God. And I was like, I'm not there yet. I would like to know how my life will change because I, I was planning to go to FLA, but now I don't know what I'm going to do. We prayed right off the bat saying, Lord, this is a, a very tough year to have a pregnancy. You know, this is a, a tough year to, to even be going to a hospital in any way, shape or form. You know, 
Um, but we trust you that, that you know what's coming in the future. You know what's best. And so, you know, we, we know that it's always a, there's always a the chance that it, that it won't work out in the beginning. And it's, you know. I didn't get better as fast as I wanted to. I was sick for about a full week. My main symptom at this point was I had a headache and I couldn't wait for my headache to go away. I didn't feel like I was having any trouble breathing, but my doctors, the team of physicians that were working with me at home thought I should be admitted to um, the hospital, which I went to Advent Health Altamont, where I'm actually a nurse, and, um, and they admitted me and um, the next morning they said my breathing was not good and uh, they, my oxygen saturation was low and I, um, uh, I had to be intubated. And that means that you basically have a tube down your throat and you can't talk to your family. They usually sedate you heavily so I wouldn't be aware of what was happening. Working uh, in the hospital, I can tell you it's been a traumatic shift, I think, for our frontline teams and um, for our leadership teams, um, for our leadership teams really just making sure uh, we're keeping everyone safe that's taking care of, of patients that may be coming in um, that are, are sick with COVID. But um, really our frontline teams, we've seen them really rise to the occasion and, and selflessly care for uh, people who are sick, not really knowing um, are we doing all the right things, do we have the right information, but really just laying it all on the line to, to ensure that um, you know, we're, we're doing what our mission statement says, which is uh, to extend the healing ministry of Christ. I was still in ICU. I still had a fever when I was extubated. They were trying very hard to get that down. And within the next, I think, day or two, day and a half, my fever was normal. As it, as it turns out, when, when the first doctor's appointment came, there was, the doctor gave it a 50-50 chance, saying it, it could be, could go, it could not go. We don't know. It was know. inconclusive, so they said, come back and uh, we'll know for sure then. But I'd say that second appointment, um, it, it, of course we had our hopes, but it, it didn't go. Um, it wasn't the news that we were hoping for. That and they- It became obvious what, what direction it was gonna go. Yeah, yeah. The timing of the, of the miscarriage worked out to be okay. right smack in the middle of our small group. We ended up having to call 911 and uh, Shirlene was losing consciousness from loss of blood and things like that and, and we just had no idea. So that in itself was, was a, a scary situation in that time um, because to go through that is one thing, to go through that in a pandemic where you're, that's a different thing. At the time this was all happening and right after it I was, I was only a shadow of what I was. I was, I was not the kind of health that I am now. My speech was slurred. My energy was only with minutes. So 20, um, 20 my, minutes or so of energy. My, my yeah. eyes would hurt. I just, I just couldn't do anything. And mm -hmm. I remember, I remember in the hospital when I was by myself, <laughs> because he's not allowed to come in. I didn't have energy to do anything. Couldn't eat, had tubes and wires everywhere. I'm probably gonna get a little emotional. I'm, I'm a single person and um, I really miss the contact with other people. Um, my parents, you know, they live in a retirement home, so I wasn't really allowed to go visit them for a while. And um, just the hugs, as a previous interview said, you know, um, I miss that. And, um, and just going down to campus, being around the students, being around, you know, their staff and faculty. At one point where I, I just, I felt very alone. I mean, I was by myself in the ICU with loud ventilator things that work with um, cleaning the air in the room. The nurses were amazing. They came in and they helped me and they, they were with me in their allotted hour time for the shift. But I have never felt so alone.
2020 has been quite a year for living in the storm, for living in unexpected times, and we've been journeying together as a people through times that we've not really lived through before. We've not necessarily understood what to even do in these times. God's been good. He's helped us, and uh, I thank Him for the people He's brought to be a part of the community that have known how to do certain things that we needed. That seems to be one of the ways that God works, if we trust Him, that uh, He will be there when we need Him. But, but part of that is the realization that sometimes we go into stormy weather. And this was the case for the pilgrims who were traveling across. They had a, a good start. It was nice weather for a while, but partway through, <clears throat> things got rough. Uh, in fact, the whole trip took them 10 weeks. Imagine that, 10 weeks. That's, that's almost as long as we spent on the Three Angels series this year. But they're 10 weeks on this voyage, and around the middle of it, they started to consistently get these storms that had these terrible winds out of the northeast, so much so that at one point, they thought they had to turn back. There's a Bible story not unlike that, found in multiple, uh, multiple books, but I'm reading here from Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. It says, Then Jesus got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And a couple of things about this story that are worth noting. First of all, some of these guys are fishermen. They've been on this lake their whole lives. This is the Sea of Galilee. They know all about it. So this must have been a pretty bad storm for them to be that worried. But then here's the other thing. Here they are frantically trying to stay alive. Jesus is sleeping. How can that be? They go wake him up. They say, don't you care? We're drowning. Verse 26, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? I want you to think about those words for a minute. He says, you of little faith, why are you afraid? Well, I could answer that question. I'm afraid because I'm in danger. I'm afraid because I don't know what to do. But you see, this is where faith comes in. When we are in danger, when we don't know what to do, can we trust Jesus in those moments? What he's saying to them there is quite profound, and it's quite profound for us as believers, and that is that the external environment, the situation we find ourselves in, is not the basis for fear. Fear for the believer is brought on when our faith has failed. How's your faith this year? Faith of the pilgrims almost failed a few times. They were out in the middle of the water and they thought they were going to have to go back. But it just turned out that one of the pilgrims had something with him that they were able to fix the main mast with and the voyage went on. They had what they needed, even though before they left, they didn't know what it was for. I think we've had that experience this year. It's turned out we've had what we needed even before we set out on this voyage of 2020, we didn't know for sure what, would, what it would bring. Of course, in the story in the Bible, Jesus gets up and calms the wind and the waves, and, and they're amazed. Sometimes the storms end that way. Sometimes they go on and on. There's a couple things to keep in mind here. One is, you're going to have storms in your life. They're going to happen. This year is an example of that. Maybe you have lots of examples of that in a different context. Maybe you have storms going on no one even knows about. The storms come. But when our faith is in Jesus, we have the right to trust. We have the right to believe that He can bring us safely through. Whatever safely through looks like. Remember, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So even if this life we're living, we should become a casualty to the storm. The promise of God is still sure. If we can start to live like that and start to think like that, do you think it's possible that instead of the storms always bringing us fear, 
Maybe we could start to see the storm, start to see the waves as an opportunity. So just want to welcome you to one of my favorite places on earth and it is the ocean. And uh, we were going to try to come out and get some footage of uh, me trying to catch a wave, but uh, the camera crew um, chose the coldest day of the year so far uh, to come out and the windiest day of the year. And the conditions aren't great for um, uh, surfing today. So one of the things about um, surfing is um, the timing and there's a swell period that comes in that sends in sets. And so part of that is when you get a set, that's your set of waves. It could be two waves, it could be three waves, it could be five waves. And um, you can choose any of those waves. You just choose what you think is the best wave. But there is a waiting period between those, sweat, those sets that come in. And that waiting period um, causes angst. Um, surfers aren't very patient people, and all they want to do is they want to surf on a wave. And so they have to wait between periods. Sometimes that's a five minute wait, 10 minute wait, and then a set can come through and other surfers can catch those waves and you miss the set. But there is a waiting part of that, and there is an anticipation um, for the next wave to come. And that's something that um, all of us uh, kind of have been doing it. We have been in this waiting moment in 2020 through seasons of angst, um, seasons of anticipation, um, seasons of pandemic, seasons of political quagmire, uh, seasons of conversations that go south. And um, one of the things that we do is we wait. All we want to really wait for is we're waiting for, can things just get better? Can things just, can this pandemic just go away? Can these conversations on social media just disappear? Can we be cordial? Can we be civil? And there is this, there is this waiting. And the problem with that is it could be a wave. It could be a wave that could let us, it, that could crush us. It could be a wave that we need to paddle for and ride it and experience it and experience it with others, but we shouldn't let it crush us. Because just like the waiting, where are we at as this wave is coming? Where are we at at this time of this wave? Do we ride it? Do we let it go through us? Do we duck dive under the wave and let it pass us over? Or do we use it for opportunity? And I think that anything in this world, just like a wave, is an opportunity for God's momentum to get us to where he wants us to go. And we can allow that wave to just pass us by, or we could fight for it and paddle for it and ride the wave of God, whatever he sends us. It's an opportunity to grow the kingdom. It's an opportunity to grow the kingdom on earth. It's an opportunity to build relationships. It's an opportunity to show people what Christians are made of and what we're really about, to show and share the love of Jesus to all. It's a wave that we can't pass up. It's a wave that he sends us. It's a wave of opportunity, and it's a wave that all people should ride. I'm looking forward to having the students, all the students be on campus. I do have hope for the future. I have something that I would like to read here that's meant a lot to me over the years. 
I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among <clears throat> all men most richly blessed. Proverbs 3, 3 through 5, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all thy ways, and He shall direct thy paths. Um, because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, there's financial, you know, the economical, health. I, I have friends, family who are going through health situations. You just don't know. And um, just trusting. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the past. He knows the future. He knows what we're going through before we do it. There's no surprises with him. You know, when I was there, there was a song that that my son Ethan had actually sang with his class for their senior outbreak. And it was called Waymaker. And I'm not into popular Christian music, but the song was like in my head. And I just remember hearing it and singing it. And it says, you are here moving in, in our midst. And I just thought about Jesus walking around the ICU moving around and I could feel him with me. It was really, it was really incredible. And then the song also says, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. And I'm just like, this is what he was in my time when I was all, I was ultimately alone and all by myself. I mean, I hadn't had anybody touch me or other than to poke me with needles, but I hadn't had anybody touch me. So it was just, it was very surreal and alone. And just knowing Jesus was there in the ICU, it's like I could feel him. I could feel his presence there. Um, I used to work like four or five days a week, um, picking up overtime all the time. Um, but with the pandemic, we actually saw a decrease on our unit. So I was able to slow down and work less and take more time to do my devotions and do my studies and to kind of just get, go a little deeper with God. I'm grateful for the opportunity to like relax and to take time um, to spend with God. It has renewed my passion for doing things in ministry because I was feeling a bit burned out. So for me personally, I think it's really um, deepened my, my faith in God, you know, interestingly. I think just, just figuring out ways in which you can connect with, you know, God differently as well as connect with family and friends differently. I think we, we've kind of moved to um, really leverage telecommunications and IT and it's really allowed me to connect with people that honestly I hadn't spoken to in, in years, college friends that, you know, we kind of just got disconnected through time. But um, with everyone really being at home and not having anywhere to go, you find yourself um, connecting with individuals and having deep and meaningful conversations um, just as you try to explore and understand um, you know, so much that was unknown. God will use this mess for good. And somehow through it all, he takes our lives and our situations that we're in when they're not good or when they are good. And he somehow uses that, that situation for a learning experience. And I think back in many times in my life when I've needed a learning experience and that's when I find Jesus. And I just think he uses messes sometimes for good, even though we don't like them. I would say definitely to trust God, have more faith, um, because nothing happens that he didn't have a plan for. Nothing is new to him, nothing is unexpected. So even though we obviously didn't anticipate all this happening and I clearly anticipated myself being somewhere else and on another floor and having another job, um, it just, God's plan is better than mine. His ways are better and his thoughts are higher than mine. So I just have to go along with what he says because he has um, the best for me and sore for me, yeah. <laughs> to let the virus stop and 
My nanny told me that God can only let Satan do things if he can allow it. I want COVID to go away, but I mean, I just hope that we will all learn how mistakes can actually bring us together and that eventually, once COVID does go away, that we'll be more unified together. Or I hope that everybody learns that being apart from each other is harder than you think when you're not apart from each other. Jesus is our rock and God is our rock. And I, I think as Christians, we can always depend and lean into knowing that um, when we feel like uh, we don't have the answers, um, God is always listening and is, is there to provide wisdom and to, to, to give us um, answers when we feel like we can't find them. The, the timing was perfect because we were um, praying and waiting for him for a long time, so it, it, it happened at just the right time. Yeah, I've held on to him a little bit like Jacob, you know, like, I won't let you go until you bless me. And when I think about it, I feel like we got more serious with God and he's getting more serious with us. The, the hindsight part of it being that when you look back on it, you really see where the Lord's hand was at work and you really see the things that he put in place. And it, it, you have the opportunity then to focus on all the bad things that the devil threw up in your way mm -hmm. or all the good things that the Lord already had in place mm -hmm. for you uh, to get you through that time and to, to help you mm -hmm. come come through that and a lot of times be blessed in that if you're willing to look at, at the side mm -hmm. of the things that he's done. Everyone's got stuff going on, whether it's in the current or the past, it's just hard to see through the weeds, it's hard to see through the storm. Yeah. But the Lord, God Almighty, He's, he's always got, he's got it covered. He right knows the answer. Hopefully we can not do the masks. Oh, I'm looking forward to not wearing my mask. <laughs> I'm looking for not wearing my, looking forward to not wearing the mask and, and just hugging people eventually. I would like to not wear my mask <laughs> and hug people again. Hugs. <laughs> Hugs. Well, the masks are just sad because the masks are just, they, they make you hot when you're hot at, from the sun. So yeah. One word to sum up 2020, I would say hopeful.
you ever spent time on the ocean and seen the waves, the powerful waves as they, as they roll along and they roll in towards the shore and maybe you even waded out in those waves and they, they crash on you, they beat you down, they seem so entirely unstoppable. But yet if you're on the shore, you turn and look and, and the waves can only go so far. Here's this energy that's built up from wind maybe even hundreds or even thousands of miles away. And, and this energy has been traveling for days and days and days, and it comes to the shore, the wave breaks, and then it's gone. The Lord says, the waves, you can come this far and no more. You see, even for the greatest trials, there's a limit. 
And the Lord will put a limit on it. But we always want to take control, don't we? We want to be in control of what's going on. We, when these troubles come on us, we want to have the perfect plan. We want to have everything laid out. Now, it's good to plan. Very important to plan. Very good to have a plan. But as, uh, as uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the great general, once said, before the battle begins, plans are critical. Once the battle begins, plans are useless. What he meant by that was, yeah, you got a plan. You got to have everything you need around and available. But if you can't change yourself when the conditions around you have changed, then you've already doomed yourself. The church, sometimes I think the church is like a ship, and it really wants to be a steamer. And what I mean by that is uh, some kind of a ship that you can control. If I want it to go, I just add fire to the furnace, and we boil more water, and we make that thing go wherever we want it to go, regardless of the waves, regardless of how the wind is blowing. And maybe that's nice to be able to do something like that, to have power like that. But here's what worries me about that. This is the road towards doing things in our own strength. This is the road towards, really, towards the failure of man. We become so convinced we know how to do it. I've come to believe that the church really is most effective when it's more like a sailboat. Because isn't the, the Holy Spirit described as a wind that comes? And shouldn't the church be waiting for the moving of the Spirit? Sitting there waiting for the Spirit of God to move. Now, planned, know where we're going, we've got charts, we know what it looks like. But waiting for the wind of the Spirit. I think about these last few years and the way that the Lord has moved in this community and and has brought different people to be a part of this community and, and expectations that we thought we had, but then the Lord worked out details and things came together in ways we could have never planned. In my own experience, God's plan is always better than the one I thought was perfect. And if I can trust Him, He'll prove that. How can we be more like a sailboat? How can we trust that the wind the Lord sends will take us where we need to go? Well, a lot of it has to do with our attitude. And I'm reminded of the words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul's kind of at the end of his message here, and he, he does a mini-sermon here in the last few verses of this passage. But at one point in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 13, the end of that verse, he says, Live in peace with each other. I think one of the first keys to catching the wind of the Spirit is that we would be committed to living at peace with one another. That, uh, like my shirt says, these are the people I love. That we would be committed to that idea. Even though some of them have crazy politics and crazy ideas and, and, and like crazy songs and, and want to do things completely new or completely old. Can we still live at peace with one another? And he goes on. He gets to verse 15. He says, Make sure nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always be kind to each other and everyone else. Okay, tolerance is a decent standard, but the Bible is asking us to be kind. That's a whole nother level. Now catch this. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Here we are, Thanksgiving 2020. So many things haven't been the way they were supposed to be. Can you give thanks for this year? You know, I look back at this year and so many things didn't go the way I wanted. But you know something that did happen this year that wouldn't have happened? We got to spend time 
with the whole family back together living in the same house again for probably the last time. Aaron had to come home from college. Nathan was home from college. Gable and Ariel were there. Suddenly it was all of us again. That wouldn't have happened. Now, yeah, it was awkward and it was hard for them and it was hard for us in different ways, but, but that's a way that we can give thanks in what happened and in the craziness of it all. The passage goes on, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It's the victory of God salvation that is ours through Jesus Christ, the fact that God created us and gave us purpose, and the promise that Jesus will come again and set things right. Are you standing squarely on the cornerstone, on Jesus himself? Don't put your starting point of faith anywhere else. It starts in the reality, the identity of Jesus, he is the Messiah, the Son of God, and His life, death, and resurrection gives you salvation and eternal life. That's the starting point. When you believe that, you're a Christian. When you believe that, you have a basis for hope. When you believe that, you can be thankful. So are you standing on the cornerstone on Christ alone. Doesn't matter what part of this community you are from, whether it's the, the conservative edge or the progressive edge or wherever, we all stand on that same cornerstone and we all come together on that cornerstone. Thank you, Jesus, for being the solid rock on which we stand. May we trust you you're in the boat, we don't have to be afraid. Oh
Ten weeks, the pilgrims were on the Mayflower, on the sea, in storms, in misery. You can imagine how excited they were when they finally arrived at Plymouth, Plymouth Rock, or at least that's what they named it. And they stepped off of the ship onto this rock that in some sense has kind of become mythical in the, in the history of the experience, that this was the point of arrival, this was everything was good now, but the truth was it was still going to be tough. They arrived late in the year, it was the month of November, and they went straight into winter and they were not ready for winter and half the colony would die before the next year rolled around, before they got to the next November. I've seen Plymouth Rock. It's, it's not that big. It's only about like this, and it has a 1620 carved onto it. But it became symbolic of the spirit that brought them there and how they believed that the Lord had called them to this land. I know there's a, a lot of different ways of interpreting the story and, and the impact that the Europeans had when they came to this new world was not always a blessing. Yet God has blessed through this land and through the heritage of those pilgrims that came to this land. They stepped off onto a rock, another piece of the world. And we live our lives on, on this earth and on various places, but, but that's not really where we stand, not really the basis of our hope, because we stand on Christ the solid rock. Our faith and our hope and our trust is in Him and all of our confidence. And He's not just a little rock about this size, He's the stone cut without hands that fills the whole earth. It is God's desire to bless those who have put their hope and trust in the Lord Jesus. And that doesn't mean we don't have trials. That doesn't mean we don't have challenges. But in the Old Testament, over the people of Israel, God told Aaron, speak this blessing over the people, and the people will be blessed. I believe the Lord wants to bless us in this season as well with those words, words that, that I've said many times at the end of a message, but, but now we hear them coming in song. I hope your heart is open, because I believe the Lord wants to bless us. So in this craziest of years, in this season of thanksgiving, open your heart and receive the blessing.
children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children This year has been a tough year for all of us. A source of hope that I always turn to is the promise in Revelation 3, or Revelation 21, that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, or pain, for all these things will be passed away. And we just have to remember that this is a short journey here on this earth, but really our journey will continue on for eternity. And that's just a source of encouragement to me that this is just gonna be a short amount of time 
and then we have an eternity of eternal happiness. Many of you may have experienced loss, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, but the Bible tells us that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything in every situation. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So I, I know we've romanticized the whole Thanksgiving experience to some degree. Um, and I think we've we've kind of forgotten about the whole entire part of like the the voyage, like the ship, and everything else that happened, um, that coming over. Uh, I was I was reading about it, and I realized, oh wait, they they came on the ship as part of the cargo, like they were they were traveling on the cargo bay, so they didn't even belong on that ship to begin with. And that makes me think of like how, you know, we, we're not of this world. Like Jesus says, you're not of this world. You belong somewhere else. And then I get to think of uh, COVID times and how this year has just been weird, been so weird, I guess, so strange. Some of us have lost jobs. We don't know what's going on. Uh, most of us are just confused at best. But I just imagine um, maybe the pilgrims were able to come out on the, on the deck of that boat. And then they were able to experience maybe a sunrise or a sunset in a deep ocean. And I get to think of like, man, the beauty and the contrast of that experience would have made that trip a little bit better. So as we go in through this experience of pandemic or I don't know, craziness, confusion, maybe darkness, and you don't feel like you belong, come out on come out on, on the deck and experience the sunset or the sunrise. Experience beauty. And don't lose that wonder of creation. Don't lose that wonder of creativity. And most importantly, uh, just don't lose hope. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.